my name is Matthew Wayne Selznick, and this is Sonatotem, episode 98. Hello, my friends, on this and every episode of Sauna Totem, we talk about making stuff, mostly writing, finding success as we each define it for ourselves, and staying healthy and sane in the process. Who am I to be talking to you about such stuff? Well, I have been an independent author since, gosh, almost the turn of the century, coming up on 20 years here. And I also help other authors and podcasters and other types of creators bring their works to fruition, to market, and to the people who should experience it. Today's episode features a conversation with the post-cyberpunk science fiction thriller author Brian Chaffin. Brian is the author of Accidental Intelligence, and as of April 2024, which is, hey, look at that, right now, he's working on the follow-up novel, Inside the Mirror, as well as multiple short stories set in the same universe. Now, you might possibly recognize the name Brian Chaffin, because in a past life, he wrote about Apple and technology for close to a quarter century as the co-founder and editor-in-chief of the Mac Observer. He and his business partner sold the Mac Observer in 2022. Brian's been busy living out his fantasy of writing fiction ever since. Today, Brian lives with his dog, Commander Ichabod Ezekiel Cromwell, in Silicon Valley, where they both enjoy the fantabulous pastime of throw the damn ball. It's a hoot. 10 out of 10 stars, Brian reports. You can find Brian... And sign up for his newsletter at geektells.com. That's G-E-E-K-T-E-L-L-S dot com. We recorded this interview on January 15th of 2024. Today, as I'm speaking to you, it is April 1st, 2024. Our conversation covers a lot of ground, and I think it's a great way to... Uh, sort of launch the conversations for the 2024 season of Sauna Totem. We get into health issues. We talk about some in-the-weeds marketing stuff and how to best reach and promote to our reader community, both current and potential. And just a whole lot of good stuff about, about the process and all the, the steps that it can take and the time it can take to go from the germ of an idea to one's first novel release. I'll be back after the conversation to wrap things up and to tell you a few things. But uh, for now, let's get right into this conversation with Brian Chaffin. So Brian Chaffin, what do you create? Wow, that is such a big question because I create a podcast. I create music sometimes, although not really a whole lot recently. And uh, I also create uh, fiction. Tell me about uh, tell me about the podcast. Uh, the podcast. I am the co-host of the Context Machine. It started off as the Apple Context Machine. It was a very Apple focused uh, show, and this stemmed out of my role as the editor in chief and co-founder of the Mac Observer which my partner and I sold in January of 2022. And uh, so my, my podcasting partner and I took our show private and renamed it to the context machine. And now we talk about, there's definitely some Apple stuff, uh, but we also talk about writing. We talk about pop culture. We talk about movies a whole lot. Um, So yeah, it's just the context machine. That's great. And, and that's a very, very respectable run 
There, there are some breaks in there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can say I've been podcasting since 2004, but there have been plenty of breaks and plenty of different shows uh, across that time. So, uh, no, that's great. And then what about music? Uh, music, I, I play everything, really, but I mostly consider myself a guitarist these days. I was in a band in from 2007 to 2009 we put out a cd i loved it uh and then here's the funny thing so i quit the band and i spent about a year playing online poker and then online poker was killed in the united states so i said you know what i'll take a year out i i i i didn't really have the means of uh, booking enough studio time or uh, uh, some solo space to record with and didn't, could not record in the place I was living at. Mm. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to take a year out to write a novel. And that was in 2010. <laughs> I published that novel in 2023. <laughs> that is, yeah, that's, that's, that's how that often goes. Uh, yes. <laughs> But I'm I'm intrigued. So you said you were you played online poker for a year. That you that was your sustaining income for a year. No, it was it was poker was my was my definitely my side gig. Gotcha. All right. Yeah. For a second there, I thought, oh, he's playing in the band. Put out the CD. Quit the band. Played online poker for a year. <laughs> yeah, it's, it sounds cool when you're saying it. Yeah, it's great. Yay me. Well, I'm awesome. <laughs> And then the fiction. So you said you started the novel. Tell me the year again. Okay. I actually started the novel and was a short story in 2001 okay. before 9-11. Mm -hmm. And I wrote the short story. I went out on a writing date with a, a woman that I'm, I'm very fond of. And we, you know, we went to a coffee shop and we hung out and, and, and we w both worked on a, a short story. I could not let that short story go. <laughs> I needed to know what was on the, the dang data cube. Right. I needed, like I needed to know. And so I spent, you know, a, a year or so uh, thinking about like, well, how am I going to carry this story forward? Because I didn't feel like the, um, so this, this would be the prologue by the way mm. of my novel, which, uh, so I didn't feel like the, that Andrew Bowers was the person to carry that story forward. And eventually I settled on his cousin, Mason Truman. And, and this is, uh, this is accidental intelligence, accidental intelligence. Yes. That, that is, I thank you. Cause we should probably mention the book, the accidental <laughs> intelligence. Mason, I, I finally settled on Mason Truman, but I then sort of, you know, didn't get around to it, to, to working on it. I, I would work on some, some world building. I, I have, you know, copious notes from, from way back then, but it was 2010 when I actually got serious about writing it. And uh, hopefully the writers out there will, will, this will resonate with them. I spent a year or two working on it, finished it, queried it, and then realized that it was a piece of crap and needed to be completely redone. Mm. So I, uh, I got, I, and, and I got a couple of pieces of, killer advice. I finally got some people who gave me the kind of criticisms that are useful, mm -hmm. you know, rather than my, my good friends telling me how awesome it was. Right, I had, right, I had yeah. a couple of people say, you know, the way you began this, it really kind of reads like a YA story. And then another person said, I don't get why anyone likes your, 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 your main character. He doesn't do anything. <laughs> and I realized that they were right. So I, you know, I, I, redid the the entire thing uh completely different ending and uh, the different structure and you know certainly a different beginning then then i started querying that 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 i basically probably piddled around with that for another two or three years mm -hmm. and began querying and queried for years before deciding to self-publish and how was how was the response on the queries i mean obviously nobody bit but did you get any decent feedback that led to additional changes or how'd that go? So I, I got tons of full requests for sure. My, my query letter was pretty good and I, I did get, I got lots of requests, uh, which led to many full requests. I didn't get a whole lot of feedback. Um, 
Lindsay Mealing. Uh, she said that uh, she really liked it. And I had her until about a little after the halfway point, in which point I lost her and pleased to query her with anything else I write. Mm. So that was fairly encouraging. And so I did kind of rework the middle a little bit and tried to make it a little more exciting and, and, and uh, uh, you know, punched it up, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And then I got a piece of uh, advice or I got the, the last person, I can't remember who this was either, but the last person, the last fool I had out, he took forever to get back to me. And he uh, finally wrote me back and said, uh, yeah, this was a near miss. Which is not a bad thing to hear. You know, no, it, it, it was a, it, it was a it really keeps nice you thing. going. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's that at that point I had queried uh, more than 120 different agents mm. and uh, decided that the time had come. Right, right. Because when you hear things like it had me until the middle, which is something you can change or fix and that it's a near miss, that's telling you that you've got something. I, I think a lot of times we, we forget that. We're not talking about whether they love the book or not. It, oftentimes it's, can I sell this? Or, you know, is this what I sell? And that might not be the case. It's not even a criticism. It's just how it is. <laughs> so there, there are two things related to this. One is that I should have given up on this book according to, you know, every bit of, let's call it rote uh, sayings about the, the publishing industry. I should have trunked the book, gone on to write something else. And queried it. I should have done that a long time ago. I probably shouldn't have queried more than like, say, 80 agents. The thing is about that is I'm super stubborn. And but more importantly, I feel like my book is good. I feel like it's better than a whole lot of things that I read. And I felt that it was too good to trunk. Mm-hmm. And it was too good to, to you know, to, to toss. And the other thing is that, you know, when it comes to getting an agent, you have to have the right agent on the right day with the right cup of coffee, with the right slush pile and have the right intern read it in the first place. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. There's a lot of, well, there's a lot of gates. (laughs) Yeah. And and, and I'm not complaining about those gates. No, no. I, but the reality is that there are just, you know, lots of things that have to sort of work out well to get an agent. And the reason why it, at that point, the reason why I even still wanted an agent, was because I I wanted the help to make my book as good as it could be. Mm-hmm. I wanted I, I you know I was I really tried to focus on um, hands on agents mm-hmm. who uh, do provide feedback. You know I I wanted I wanted someone's feedback, and then I also wanted the feedback from the editors at a publisher because I wanted my book to be as good as possible. Uh, and yeah, that's a, that that's the that's the real reason I queried. And then the shift to, to self-publishing, because again, like you said, it's, it's too good to trunk. Yeah. You, know, you knew you had something good going on. Uh, and, and why not? Um, I want to, I want to dive a little deeper into that, but there's something that I always follow up that first question with. And so I want to circle back. We, we heard what you create. Why do you create? Oh, wow. Um, let's see. I, okay. (laughs) Secret. I create because I want to be remembered. I want to make something that's going to resonate with people. I want to make something that's going to have me remembered by someone, anyone. And, and why, why did you preface that with secret? Because I, I'm, it's not something I readily admit. I'm apparently now readily admitting it, but <laughs> yeah, because because at least a couple score people are going to hear this. So. <laughs> yeah, so it's I'm, no secret anymore. <laughs> I'm I'm confessing. I'm I'm absolutely confessing, and, and I also like I mean, that's I I wanted to be a rock star. That's why I was in a band. Sure, I wanted to be a rock star because who doesn't want to be a rock? Well, I guess lots of people don't want to be a rock star, but <laughs> I wanted to be a rock star, and I. And I had a little bit of, you know, local rock star success and, and that was great. And I probably would have continued to focus on, on music for, for a while after that year of spending, uh, playing poker. If, uh, if, 
the you know the 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 you know the sort of resources necessary to to do that had been available mm-hmm. you know again i'm i'm still taking a year out for to write a book yeah 14 years later <laughs> but uh yeah so i i i also um the, i i very much have some kind of storyteller in me you know so uh, the songs i write are absolutely me telling stories and the story of mason is um uh a story that, that that's in me I've, I've got two more books i want to write i've got uh uh some uh, some side stories that i feel like i need to tell and and you know like i said if i can end up getting somebody to care about that after i'm gone that would be amazing and what do you think drives that desire for for we'll call it legacy mm, uh vanity um hubris <laughs> 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 I, I i don't i don't know that there's anything particularly good or noble about that desire but uh but it's there yeah Okay. Yeah. I, I ask because, uh, I'm driven very much by the same, uh, desire for legacy. Uh, and, uh, it wasn't always the case. Um, but as I got older, uh, and as I, uh, you know, saw my mother age and pass away and then saw, you know, her unfinished creative things, um, it became more important, you know, uh, that, that checks out and, and my condolences. Oh, oh, it's been, yeah. Thank you. It's been, uh, gosh, coming up on five years. But before that, if, if I had to answer that question of, of why do I create, I mean, short version is that, that it provided me as a child, it provided me with an environment that I could control. Um, yeah. And, and that slowly shifted into that more, uh, that desire to, as you say, to, to be remembered, to, to have something that affects somebody in some way. Um, so, uh, so when I hear people say, you know, that, that particular phrase in, in one way or another to be remembered or to, to have a, a legacy of some sort definitely resonates because I can, I can certainly relate. Is, is vanity or hubris, uh, you know, all that bad? I mean, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's just that desire to be, uh, to, to continue on after you're gone. Um, and, uh, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, the wanting to be a rock star, kind of the same thing. Uh, having been a musician myself and having achieved that same sort of medium sized fish in a small pond, uh, <laughs> <laughs> local hero kind of thing uh many many years ago um that was definitely not the i'm doing this because i want to be remembered someday was it for you even then or has it similarly kind of evolved over the years i would imagine that so all right so i had a stroke on june 6th no, June 4th. Of oh, this past year? This past year, yes. Okay. I'm lucky. I it was a severe stroke, and I'm apparently a top 1% of results kind of guy, and have essentially recovered fully. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah, that's, 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 that's fantastic. Yeah. But that probably has put a more poignant edge to this idea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and it was after that that I decided to self-publish. It was mm. after that that I decided that, look, time's a-wasting, man. Mm-hmm. You're 57 years old, dude. You <laughs> go do this because if you're not going to do it now, when are you going to do it? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I know that I know that my feelings on this have evolved over the years. I don't know that I could, like, specify exactly how. Like, because so going going back to my twenties when I wanted to be a rock star, the, this, this, you know, the wanting to be a rock star thing probably lasted for 30 years and mm-hmm. in, in definitely into my late forties. And certainly when I was in my twenties, it was definitely about being a rock star to be a rock star. It wasn't about legacy because mm-hmm. I'm going to live forever. Right. Of course. Dying and being remembered. That's, that's what 
old people do. So shut up. Let's get me in front of the stage. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, you know, that, that's probably the beginnings of it. And, and, you know, now I'm definitely, and, and it's not just a legacy. It is also like, I desperately want to affect somebody. I want somebody to read my book and, 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 and care about it. Like, you know, to, to make it, to make people think if, if I can do that, yay. And so, and I don't necessarily, this is not necessarily very fair because I don't quite have a handle on why it is that I feel the same way, but, but what, what do you think is, is pushing that, that need to, to not just be heard, but to have that kind of effect. I don't know. Um, I, I, so it's, I, I got to start mixing my stories again because when I was editor in chief of the Mac observer, that was also certainly a bit of a rock star kind of thing. Oh, sure. Everybody and remembers the Mac observer. If you've, if you've been online for any amount of time. Yeah. That, Thank you. That's okay. <laughs> uh, Mic drop. I'm out. See you. Uh, <laughs> You're done. <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> I, 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 I guess I, I guess I also don't know how to necessarily specify or uh, I was going to say articulate, but it's specifying the ways in which this idea have uh, aff affected me or affected me, affected me, affected me. <laughs> Uh, over the years, it, it, it's constantly, it's constantly shifted, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's a tricky one. I mean, it, it's, like I said, I, I don't have an answer for that myself. The only thing that I can say about that is that, and this is, this is cliched, you know, writer's greeting card type stuff, but no one can tell the stories that you're going to tell the way you're going to tell them. Yes. And you want to talk about hubris, uh, or, uh, as I've heard it referred to the, the, the noble delusion, um, that writers kind of have to have is that it's our responsibility to tell those stories for the very f reason that we don't know who, or how we're going to affect with them. You know, it's, it's the, 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 the not unintended consequences, but the unknowable consequences, usually positive. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to safely say, I think, uh, that come about when someone reads something that someone else you know has created, especially perhaps maybe not especially, but, but for sure when it comes to fiction, because, that's, you know, uh, smarter people than me have, have observed that that fiction is uh, an empathy generator, a, a connecting influence. Um, you know, it's it's capital G, capital W, good work. Um, so those of us who, who have this irrational drive to do it. Uh, I I'd say that again, it's, it's almost a responsibility, um, to at least try. And, uh, and, and, and that's as close as I've come to, <laughs> to figuring out that, uh, you know, beyond the vanity and the hubris, uh, why is it, is it so damn important? Uh, I mean, uh, we could dig into our mutual childhoods and figure out if it's just because we weren't heard enough, you know, but uh, I think the end result uh, is the, the sort of net positive effect we can have on the world. Um, and uh, you know, feel free to call shenanigans on that or, or give you, give me your thoughts no, on, I, I, on that. Like, like no notes. <laughs> it's well, well said. And uh, at least, as far as I'm concerned. So um, I want to touch cause uh, you know, disclosure for the, for the listeners, I did just finish uh, accidental uh, intelligence 
and 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 usually we don't get into specific works too much on this show because the idea is that the conversations are kind of evergreen. But this is going to kind of probably tie into a bit of your your sort of extended origin story. Hmm. But one thing I noticed about the book, and and just briefly for the for, again for the edification of the listener, it's it is basically a a uh, detective noir story uh, in a cyberpunk wrapping. Is that fair to say? Yes, it is fair. I consider it post cyberpunk. Okay. But that's probably me being super precious. <laughs> As is your right. Uh, <laughs> but the thing that struck me, and, and I wanted to just uh, honestly, uh, it, honestly, for my own curiosity, but this is kind of probably interesting for folks just in terms of where our influences lie. Um, you know, I've read a lot of, 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 Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett and, and uh, you know, th those forties, fifties, sixties, and seventies hard boiled detective books mm -hmm. and, and seen my share of, of, of movies in the same genre. And the, and I mean this in the best way, because sometimes when people say tropes, it's not a positive thing, but you hit or at least intimated on all of the tropes um, without it being, you know, particularly heavy handed. It is a classically structured noir private eye book. And I was just curious how much of that is kind of in your veins and was it intentional uh, in when you structured the book and, and, you know, and I realized that the structuring, as you mentioned, didn't all take place at once, but, was it sort of top of mind? Like I'm really going to try to emulate this, but with this, with this extra science fiction flavor on top of it, man, I, I don't know which I, I would rather be saying that, yes, I have done all of this by plan or, or, or osmosis. Like, yeah, osmosis. <laughs> the reality is that, um, this story took shape as it almost had to mm -hmm. from, sorry, from my perspective. Yeah. And I was not, I was definitely not trying to emulate any particular structure at all. I haven't read a lot of hard boiled detective stuff. Uh, I haven't read any Chandler, which I goodness knows I need, need to fix that. But uh, um, I was a cent okay, so I'm a, I'm a pantser, right? Okay, and I was essentially approaching this story from the stamp, like I was working it out with Mason. Mm. Like, how does everything happen, and how does it happen in a realistic uh, way? And I I'm delighted that that I, I hit on all the tropes, but. It was definitely not intentional. So in any kind of, of, I mean, this is sort of the open secret about writing any, any kind of mystery. Uh, and, and, you know, this is a sort of a subset of the mystery superset, you could say. Um, it, there's a lot of third and fourth draft going back and sticking this in the third paragraph of chapter three and this in the eighth paragraph of chapter 10. And, and a lot of, since you did pants it, a lot of going back and making things seem like it was always meant to be. <laughs> yes. hundred percent. And you had a lot of that going on. Uh, I've also got lots of teasers for book two in there. Ah, yeah. Uh, little, uh, little hooks to, to, to hang extra stuff on. And you, when you mentioned side stories and stuff, uh, that's something I'm very fond of. I call it story buds, like a coral, mm -hmm. like a coral will bud, you know? Um, I like that. You know, uh, what happened before that character walked in the room? What happened after they left the room? <laughs> um, yeah, it's good fun. And, and yeah, it's, it's it, when, 
it's interesting the way it, it progresses because you started this as a short story. You weren't satisfied with, with, uh, you know, you had a question that you couldn't not answer. Uh, and that grew into what is now, you know, you've, you've got your next few years of work cut out for you, yeah. uh, which is, which is great. This book has been out for, uh, a little two over months a, and two days, two months and two days. Right. So it's an interesting time to ask this question. Uh, and it's, it's the second sort of tentpole of the show. How do you define success as a writer and where do you feel like you are on that, uh, on that scale, on that spectrum? Wow. Um, success. I am probably experiencing the most commercial success that I could possibly expect as an independent author who, whose book did not go massively viral. Mm -hmm. I sold 173 copies in two months. And that's, I, I, I'm certainly told by some folks that that's pretty good. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy as can be, but I always intend, like once I made the decision to self-publish, it's like, this is, this is a foundation, you know, like I've got, I've got to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. I've got to put out the first book. And then the second book will probably be the one that gets a little more attention. And then the third book and then the fourth book and the fifth book, et cetera. So, uh, I feel like I've, I've, I've done pretty well with it for everything that I've done. And I, you know, I'm, I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm super happy. I mean, like it, by no means has this book made a profit. <laughs> I, I haven't even paid for the cover mm. and uh, let alone the various bits of marketing. I did some Facebook marketing. I've done some, um, some Amazon marketing and I did, uh, well, I guess that's all the paid marketing I've done is Amazon and, and, you know, Facebook slash Instagram. Uh, and you know, th those, those did fairly well for me. Uh, but yeah, so I, uh, I don't know. Am I answering the question? Well, you tell me, uh, are, like you said, it's, it's a foundational thing. Um, you, you feel good, uh, about the 173 copies in two months. And I think you should, that's, that's pretty great for, uh, the first two months for, for someone who is, is effectively uh, a first time author, you know, um, I think, uh, I'm curious, you, you said, uh, you did some Facebook and some Amazon, uh, ads, uh, and you were happy about it. Does that mean that they earned out more than you spent on them? <laughs> no, okay. uh, no, no, by, by, by no means. Uh, I, and, and, but I didn't expect them to. Okay. I, it was very much, you know, a loss leader to sort of get my, my mm. name out there. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Facebook stuff definitely did, did fairly well in, in the grand, in the grand scheme of things. But I, I would imagine that, that I, I, I don't know, I probably sold 50 or 60 books from the Facebook stuff. And, and I can tell you specifically on the Amazon advertising, let me, let me flip through my mini, mini open windows. <laughs> uh, I have sold three books through Amazon ads and spent 101 bucks doing it. Mm, okay. Yeah. Uh, so this, I, so I, I've only reason I've kept that going is because it's, you know, it's basically peanuts. Uh, it's peanuts to me. I'm in a sure. privileged position. Okay. And, and, and I asked that because there's, first of all, there's, depending on the day of the week and who you ask, people are crazy for Facebook ads or they're not. And they're crazy for Amazon ads or they're not. Um, and I'm always curious about that. Uh, and with Facebook, uh, that's a nut that, that I've yet to crack, um, you know, in terms of actually seeing it generate, uh, specific sales, I suspect, um, that because your book is in a 
I mean, it's an, it's a niche within a genre, right? Yeah. But it's, but it's not an unheard of or unknown niche within a genre. You know, there are plenty of science fiction mysteries, science fiction noir type stuff. Um, especially in that, you know, what, as you, as you say, sort of post cyberpunk, uh, slightly longer than near future, uh, <laughs> setting, um, there's a market for it that's recognized, you know? So, um, I'm curious as to like with your Facebook ads, how much targeting did you do, uh, to get, uh, to get the results that you, that you got? I did, I started did a little bit of a targeting, but I also allowed them to further tweak it. And I was getting insane click throughs mm-hmm. on the, on the Facebook stuff. I was getting 6%. Oh, wow. Wow. Jeez. Yeah. So that's one reason why I kept it going. I, I still got it going again at two. So I, I, I was spending a lot more, but I, I've cut it down to a $5 cap. And that's really just so that I still have some people coming to my site because mm-hmm. yeah. uh, my site doesn't otherwise get a ton of traffic. Right. So the Amazon ads are supposedly targeted by Amazon. Right. And, um, I, I don't know how well they're doing with that. The, the, the things that I've, uh, and you know, hopefully this is useful to folks that the, the things that I've found necessary with the, with the Amazon ads is, uh, to just really, when you do get those clicks to really take a look at what searches are resulting in the clicks. Mm. Uh, um, you know, it, and if it's, uh, because, you know, you know, they'll do the, exact match, close match, complimentary related, you know, uh, all these things that might end up, people might end up seeing your ad when they're searching for something that's kind of far afield, you know? Um, and if they click on it, they're going to see that, okay, well, this is not the, the thing that I want. It's just something adjacent to adjacent to <laughs> the thing right. that I want. <laughs> so I keep a careful eye on that and I employ, uh, the negative keywords feature. Mm. Um, you know, so if, you know, if, if, uh, if my, that, that, that book that I'm, I'm focusing on is the young adult in everything, but name and kind of an alternate history and kind of a superheroes thing, but it, I don't want people who go for like the actual superhero novels where they're in long underwear and, you know, fighting crime, you're not going to like this. So I keep a careful eye on that. Um, and it does seem to help a little bit. The outsider. Uh, this, no, this is a book called a brave men run. This is, uh, my first novel from from a couple of, a couple of decades ago. (laughs) I've got Uh, light of the outsider that I haven't read yet. Yeah. Uh, I'm happy to hear that because it's, it's, uh, it's a much better book. Uh, Awesome. <laughs> but uh the other thing, and I don't know if this is a trick you know, it might be a trick that that uh our our listeners don't know, is in that negative keywords on Amazon, include your own name. Hmm. Because you don't want to pay for people searching your name. Of course you don't. <laughs> oh my goodness. Right? <laughs> when I learned that, I was that exact same reaction, like, duh. <laughs> Wow. I feel, uh, both enlightened and stupid at the same time. That's exactly how I felt. That's why I'm passing it on. (laughs) Awesome. But ads are, yeah, ads are, are uh, crazy. Uh, it's, you know, I know people make a lot of money out of teaching other people how to run them, but I'm not sure that that's anything but snake oil because it's so, so specific to the genre and the, and, and the, even down to the sub genre, um, it's boy talk about your mileage may vary Uh, (laughs) for sure. Yeah. And um, so, okay. So this is a foundational book. Obviously it's, it's the launch of a career and that's the, the the place that you're at. Uh, It took, shall we say some time for the first book to be, to be finished and come out. Um, You've got some momentum going here. What's your, have you got a, a, a sort of a release schedule worked out for yourself? And, and I say that knowing that, you know, again, uh, the best laid plans and all that, 
have you figured out sort of how you can comfortably uh, when you can comfortably release the next book and the book after that and all that, or, or are you just letting it ride? You know, I, I have a very, very firm deadline of finishing this book as soon as I can. <laughs> and right. I am not a fast writer. Mm-hmm. Like uh, I see, I, the, the, there's uh, the, the Nick Fowler okay. on threads mm-hmm. who, who, who's written eight books this year. I can't do that. That's not my thing. Yeah. So, um, uh, and you know, and, and, uh, Patty Jensen, who I think is amazing with fantastic advice for writers. She's got 60 books that she's put out over 13 years. Again, I can't do that. So I very much hope to have book two out by summertime is probably being ambitious. And, uh, and then I also have, I have a short story that's pretty much ready to go. I have, a got to, I got to get a cover for it and I, I really need to go ahead and send it to a uh, professional editor. Mm-hmm. And, um, so anyway, I'll be releasing a short story in the near future. And then this, the second book, you know, summertime, maybe, maybe next fall. And, uh, well, that's, that's great. I mean, the, the, the idea of a sort of a, a little interim work, uh, I think is smart. You know, if you can, if you can throw a short story or two out there, especially if you find that getting the novel shipped is, is taking longer, you know, at least that's, I hate to put it this way, but feeding the algorithm, but also giving your readers and, yeah. and, and your, your people on your mailing list and whatnot, uh, something to be reminded by, you know, uh, which is great. And I want to say just, just as an aside, whenever people tell the world that they've released X number of books in a year, I want to know, okay, well, what are we calling a book? (laughs) Oh, sure. Sure. (laughs) Is this a novella or, you know, is it a 200,000 word book stop, a doorstop? You know, what, what are we really saying here? (laughs) That, that's true. And I, and I'm not, I'm not picking on, on either one of those. Oh, people. no, 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 I, no, not at all. I, I, I just, um, uh, I just meant that there are some people who are, who are very prolific sure. for words. Yeah. And I am not, I am very specific and, uh, I can, I, I don't even want to get to the point where I can crank out a novel fast. I, 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 I just don't, but yeah. But, um, you know, there are plenty of people who do, and that's, that's more power to them. Oh, sure. Yeah. It's not a criticism. I, I just, I always want to know the context when I hear any kind of progress or claim or anything like that. It's like, well, okay, no, that is awesome. And that's, you know, you're adding to your back catalog, which is essential. Uh, and, uh, and, but it is always good to know like, uh, okay, what's the genre? What's the, what's the word, word count there? You know, uh, what's the rest of your life look like? Right. (laughs) Absolutely. You know, that's a big one. (laughs) That's another kind of as good of a segue as we're going to get. You've had a a pretty crazy last 18 months or so. uh, I'm, I'm estimating uh, with the stroke and, and all of the attendant stuff. Uh, Hmm. Seven months, stroke, seven, of stroke, stroke of seven months ago, seven months, which is astounding, especially considering all that you've been doing. Uh, you know, the, the book has been out for you know, two of those months. So <laughs> that's true. Thank and, you. Every, and everything that goes into making sure that that happens. So that's, that's remarkable. So however you want to want to talk about it, however much depth you want to go, the the third part of 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 sonatotum is is that dot 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 and staying healthy and sane in the process uh boy i don't even know how to how to how to ask this in in your case i feel like saying so what have you learned <laughs> mm. wow so, I, I i've lost 61 pounds mm-hmm. and uh in in since since my stroke and wow. so i have Definitely. I, you know, it was a wake up call for me. Mm-hmm. It was, it was a massive wake up call for me. And I have just, you know, essentially uh, just 
chosen to embrace it. I have been very focused. I do have a day job and I've been very focused on, um, uh, on, on, on the book side of things and in building my social media presence and then, you know, marketing the book, uh, getting the website redone. I don't know. I guess my focus is really just kind of one day at a time. And are you writing actively right now as well? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. I, 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 I didn't for definitely. Ooh. Well, okay. So the truth is the second book I've been working on it for years too. Mm-hmm. I had uh, a section like I had plotted it out. So I was trying to go from being a answer to a plotter mm-hmm. and I plotted it out, but I hand waved apparently didn't without realizing it. I hand waved a very pivotal thing. I needed to get Mason into the story mm-hmm. and I've struggled with getting him past that. And I, I think I do have him past it now, but that is sort of like, stalled me out I, i'm but also by the way i'm a, I'm a linear writer mm. i can't write you know a scene until the until we get there right and uh, i very very much admire and envy people who you know can just write whatever scene they they want to write uh so my point is that i stopped actively writing when i was releasing the book and Probably uh, right about the first of the year as uh, I got, I got serious about putting words down again. Right. Okay. So you're balancing a day job. What I imagine are some, some, some pretty substantive lifestyle changes and marketing and promoting one book and doing all the heavy thinky bits on the <laughs> new book. Uh if there is a routine or anything that you do to, to sort of, to sort of keep things balanced, uh, share that with, share that with me. I do have a bit of a routine. Uh, my, my day job is, is essentially a part-time job and I tend to get up and I do Wordle because that's important. I do connections, the, another related game. Mm-hmm. And, and then I'll do my day job and, then futz around on the internet until it's time for dinner, eat dinner, watch an episode of a TV show and then write. And, um, I keep that balanced by simply doing it. And before the health scare and I I, health scare, it's almost, uh, uh, putting it obscenely lightly, uh, <laughs> did you have a, a similar amount of discipline or has that, is that new? I do not think that one should make the mistake of attaching the word discipline to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it was, it was largely, well, yeah, I can, I can actually, I guess I probably was even less disciplined before. Mm-hmm. So I would tend to stay up really late and then get up really late. And, uh, I tend to, I basically sort of, so I currently go to sleep from like two to 10 now. Mm -hmm. And for years I would sleep in shifts, uh, because you know, the Mac observer we published on a, on an Eastern, uh, time zone and I'm in the Pacific time zone. Gotcha. And it was probably a lot of the same as what I described for my current life, only with more donuts and, um, and cookies. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And later in the day. Right. And that, you know, that, that odd, uh, broken sleep pattern, um, that, that can have, that can be detrimental too. Uh, Oh yeah. I'm yeah. sure that contributed to me eventually having a stroke, quite frankly. Yeah. And I'm, but on the other hand, I, uh, I've always been intrigued by when we were still in the candlelit age, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> um, looking at, I guess, letters and journals from, from various people from that era, a lot of folks would have supper, go to sleep, wake up around you know, two or three and have a little mini day <laughs> yep. in the middle of the night, do some correspondence or, you know, whatever, and then have another you know, four to five hours of sleep. And then now it's the real day. And, uh, it, it's, uh, so that couldn't be 
too terrible for people. When you talked about your, your kind of sleeping in shifts kind of thing, it made me think of that. But, but I reckon, uh, you know, one thing that those, uh, those folks were doing was kind of going to bed when the sun went down, you know, yeah. uh, and, and allowing their natural, okay, well, I guess I'm awake now. I'll, I'll find something to do until I'm tired again. In some ways, I sort of envy that pattern. And the other, in other ways, I'm like, hmm, boy, I don't know. It's hard enough getting, getting six hours straight. <laughs> no joke. <laughs> so if you could distill or summarize the things that you've learned, figured out, sussed out, landed on <laughs> as, as useful in, in your writing life, if you could bring it down to maybe something that you would put on a coffee mug or a bumper sticker, what would that bumper sticker say? Pay attention. And what does that mean to you? Pay attention to what people say. Pay attention to what people do. Pay attention to the difference between what people say and what people do. Pay attention to the way people move. Pay attention to their body language. Pay attention to, uh, pay attention to the way that, um, the most dynamic lead person in any particular grouping of people, the way everyone is looking to them and they get, they're not looking at anybody else. But pay attention to the way that the uh, subservient person moves and, and, and acts. Pay attention to the way the, the domineering jackass moves and, <laughs> and, 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 and speaks and just pay attention to what people do. And, Try to convey that on paper. Observe, observe, observe. Yep. Can you think of a time when you were writing that, 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 that you hadn't figured that out? And, and is it something that, that, that just, you know, gradually grew to be something that you figured out or was there kind of a, a an epiphany, a, a eureka moment? That eureka moment for me was probably before I started writing. Um, Dan Simmons is one of my favorite writers. Mm -hmm. He wrote a book in particular called The Summer of Night. It's a horror story that's, uh, it's not a young adult book, but it is a book with, with kids. Mm -hmm. But it's very much a, an adult story. Okay. And those kids are in 1960 small town Illinois. And they're riding bikes and they're in the dirt and the, you know, they, they're, they're in like a, they don't have really much TV and I don't know anything about living like that. And yet he made me, I like, I would find myself nodding along going, yeah, yeah. I remember that. <laughs> but I didn't remember that. He, he has this immersive way of writing. Anyway, the one of his, one of these kid characters wanted to be a writer. And this kid was like, you know, probably, uh, probably on the spectrum and was definitely an old soul in a young body. And, and, and he talked about the fact that he would go on exercises for, for writing because he said to himself and the character said this to himself is like, if I want to write, I have to write. Mm -hmm. I can't write until I learn how to write and I can't learn how to write until I write. And so he would just write things. And that really stuck with me. Now, Dan Simmons, it's, it's his uh, Hyperion and the fall of Hyperion that really made me want to, to be a writer. But the, the summer of night was also a, a big part of it. But anyway, the point is that that kid character created by Dan Simmons probably put a lot of this into my head, this, this notion of observing and, and whatnot. And plus, uh, I certainly would encounter writing advice to that effect from, from other people. And, and it just, it, it resonated with me all along. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that, that, that your current work started as a short story on kind of a writing date. Was that short story among the first things fiction that you'd been trying to write or had, had you been working at it for a while? Where did that fall in the, in the, on the timeline? Wow. I'm going to have to confess this. It was the very first piece of fiction I wrote. <laughs> right on. And right I couldn't let it go. That's now, perseverance. I've, 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 written, <laughs> I've written some other shorts. I've read, I've, I've, I've got another couple of books that I've dabbled with. Mm -hmm. um, I've definitely written a crap ton of poetry and I've written songs. Yeah. That was the first 
full story that I wrote. So is there anything that we haven't touched on that you wish we had or that we kind of came close to and skittered away in the course of the conversation and you'd like to swing back around on? Um, anything along those lines? Uh, yeah, I had this crazy idea about uh, about how to release a series of shorts that I was looking forward to maybe mentioning. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it's, it's, it's stupid because you can't actually do it. So you well, know. maybe it is, maybe it isn't. What do you got? So I, I, that short story that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. So my first thought was I'm going to release it as a free story. Okay. Because it is often suggested that you have the first book in a series be free. And then the other, or cheap and the other, the other books, you know, to, 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 to rope people in, mm -hmm. I'm not going to release my only book, free book. Right. So, but I ah, have a short story and it's set in Mason's universe. It is uh, not directly attached to the, the first story arc, mm -hmm. but it is definitely connected to it. And I'm, so I'm going to release that for free. And then I thought, wait a minute, what if I released it for free? And told people that I'm going to really, I'm going to add more short stories to this book. And every time I add a story, I'm going to increase the price by 50 cents. But if you already own this, the book, even for free, you will get all eight stories for free. That sounds good. I like the idea, but yeah. I, but that was when I thought that you could update uh, an Amazon and an Apple, uh, Apple books uh, in particular um, book and have it automatically pushed out. Well, I know you can on, on Amazon. Mm, you, the, the, the user has to initiate the download. Oh, okay. No. Yeah, of course. Yeah. They have to initiate the download and Amazon in particular. I, I didn't even dig into it with Apple books, but Amazon in particular gets really tense about the, uh, about, exceptions for updating stuff. Oh uh, yeah. So first of all, it, you could make life much easier on yourself if you do that, but don't do it on Amazon. Sure. Give away the original short story on Amazon or wherever, you know, out in the marketplace, let's call it. But the updates, the, the added content they have to be on your mailing list to get that. Yep. That's, that's fair. That's definitely an, a good idea. And then, you know, and that's, that's the, the, the plug at the end of that free short story that they buy on Amazon or Kobo or wherever is, you know, sign up to the mailing list. And every time there's a new short story, you're going to get a new edition. And then you can track because you're not going to be able to track, you know, it's the nature of the beast. You're not going to be able to track who is updating that thing. <laughs> who's choosing to update it right on, on Amazon, but you will be able to do that if you're doing it through your own mailing list and pushing them, uh, you know, you'll be able to see, oh, okay, they clicked on the download. I don't know. And then maybe when you get to, I don't know how, how frequently you imagine doing this, but maybe when you get to five stories or 10 stories or whatever, uh, you throw them a coupon for, by then one of the two or three novels. Sure. You know? Um, but yeah, I would totally do that in house. I would do that uh, as, uh, as something that you attach to your mailing list so that you're building that community uh, and hooking them in and you know who they are and you have a way to directly track uh, what they're doing. Yeah, that makes sense. You started off saying it was uh, stupid, but no, I think it's it's savvy. I think it's smart. Um, I think you've, you've got a great idea with this gradually growing anthology uh, that that basically people are rewarded with for sticking around. Um, and, you know, if folks know that they sign up on your mailing list and they know that they don't unsubscribe eventually they're not going to get one short story they're going to get a whole book full of short stories i think that's a strong incentive and it's it's very much in the spirit of you know give 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 ask you know yeah. and uh yeah i think you should do it 
I am pro I'm going to, I'm going to do something. I just got to, I got to sort it out. Write the stories. <laughs> yeah, I, do. I, I have, I have the one story written. I don't have the, eight. so what my, my original idea was to promise eight stories and then deliver 10 for the, for the, the, the nice. two extra, the two mm-hmm. extra being free. Yeah. And that would put the, per, the in price of the, of the, of the eight stories at three ninety nine, which is less than the four ninety nine that I'm charging for the, for the book. Plus this would also give me the opportunity to routinely promote the fact that, that, that you know, this book, this book exists and uh, make sure you buy it uh, within the next two weeks because it's, it's, going to get a new story and go up in price after yeah. that. Yeah. And you know, it, it presented lots of nice ideas, but I'm not going to be able to do it that way. I could do it the way you're talking about. I'm going to figure something out. Here's the other thing is, and I'm going to be doing this with, with that free serial is once that story arc is closed. And in your version, it would be once your 10 stories are given to all your free people, of course you can turn around and sell that anthology. Yeah, I could do. For you know, sure. the thing is to always just never like, and this is more for the listener than for you. I think you already know this, but I see people, clients of mine, authors are like, well, if I, if I'm going to do this free thing, why don't I just uh, give them the thing that I've already got free over here? Why don't I give that to my mailing list? Well, there's no incentive there. <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know so yeah it's like yeah, yeah mailing list free stuff needs to be particular it needs to and specific to the mailing list and exclusive yeah yeah exclusive yeah, i that's, think that's the word yeah um you know and if you if you change it up that's a different thing but honestly and i can't remember if i've told my mailing list list this or not so if they're listening which they darn well better be uh <laughs> when i get to the point where that serial is repackaged as a novel they're all going to get that for free anyway Oh, yeah. you know, funny enough, I, I knew that. Yeah. Without you telling me. Right. You know, it's just like, surprise, here it is. You know, of yeah. course, I'm, you know, why wouldn't I? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so do you, do you sell books on your site? I do. Yeah. Uh, up until the beginning of this year, I was using Gumroad, um, which is uh, a third party service that's, you know, it's just, they're basically a download and payment processing all in one kind of thing like pay hip or any of these other ones. Um, but uh, with the new website that I launched on January 4th, the direct sales are truly direct. Uh, they buy from me. It comes downloaded from my server and I'm no longer having to give Gumroad the extra, whatever it is, 10%. I'm only, I'm only taking the payment processor cut of, you know, the standard 2.9% plus 30 cents. What are you using to deliver? Uh, it's a plugin called member press. Uh, it is, it's, it's running my direct sales. It's running my, uh, membership community and eventually it will be running my online courses. It's a WordPress plugin. Yeah. It is not cheap, but I think it's worth it. It's, it's interesting because the reality is that you would want more sales going from your, like if you're going to get a sale, you would rather have it come from your site, right? Yes. Because your, your collection of the, the total amount spent is much higher. Yeah. And I get their email. And you get their email. Which is worth much more. Fair enough. But at the same time, you also want the chance of climbing on the sales charts. Well, that's just it. I, I don't know how much I'm concerned about that anymore. My, my glib, but serious... Uh, sort of standard is I make things for people who like the kinds of things I make. And so if I can serve a community of people who specifically like the kinds of things that I make, it's not dependent on genre or pen name or expectations of, Oh, he writes this kind of book. I don't want that other kind of book that he writes which, you know, you have to worry about that cannibalizing from yourself and stealing from yourself uh, on Amazon and whatnot. If you switch up genres and things like that. Sure. If, if I can build a good sized community, I would much rather do that than have to chase sales rankings on any of the marketplaces. 
I mean, sure, I'd happily sell a book on Amazon or wherever now and then, but I'd rather not have to work so hard on that because those those people are anonymous. I want people who are committed uh, and who are collaborators in what I'm doing. And I don't mean necessarily artistic collaborators, but I think of, uh, and longtime listeners are going to be like, here he goes. But I think of, <laughs> I think of our readers as our peers. We, we don't really get much without them. And, and of course we are providing for them as well. So I would rather have a community of, of readers who I have some kind of direct connection with uh, and also who are, you know, ideally sustaining me to make more things. I'd rather have that than chase after sales on Amazon or have to try to do these ads or any of that stuff. Or, you know, but that's just, that's the direction I'm in now. It remains to be seen if it's, if it's insanity. <laughs> but that being said, it's, it's just, and you know, this from, you know, you, we're the same age and we've been on the internet the same amount of time. The, the best possible thing you can do is, is, is have a way to contact and reach out directly, you know, with your, with your listeners, even if your listeners, your readers, even if you are sending them to Amazon ultimately or wherever. I send people to my site. Are they buying directly from there or? No, not yet, but I do have uh, the, 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 the book page I've got has got links to it. Yeah. Everywhere that's available. Yeah. Yeah. You're doing it right. You know, um, in as much as, as there is a way to do it right, you know, with that caveat, but yeah, of course, send them directly to the site and have some way to track what they're doing. I mean, ultimately so that we can serve them, uh, as best as we can, which, you know, in our case means selling them more books. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> well, this has been cool. Anything else you'd like to add or, uh, or, or comment on? Before yeah. Can we, we, can we maybe up? solve the AI issue? Before we oh, go? sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that should take, let's see, it's five twenty-seven. Yeah. We can do that in another three minutes or so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. That, that would, that would be uh, something I would, I would love to get into with you. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, um, you know, you know where Anytime. to find me. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe we'll have you on uh, the contact machine. Hey, I'd love it. I'd love it. I'd absolutely love it. I'm trying to get on some more shows uh, and uh, balance out the the hosting and guesting kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's much it's much more fun to be a guest. <laughs> There's less work afterwards, that's for sure. Yes. <laughs> well, all right, Brian. Thank you so much for being a guest on Sonatotem. Thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate it. Well, there it is, folks, my conversation with the science fiction thriller post cyberpunk author Brian Chaffin. I hope you dug it. I hope you got a lot out of it. I did. And I was pretty inspired by, wow, the year that he has had <laughs> and the progress that he has made in that year, considering the monumental health scare and also releasing a book and just keeping on uh it's it's you know i look at what's going on in my own life and i'm i'm really really kind of busy and a little against the wall and burning the candle at, at at both ends and then throwing the candle in the fire itself so it was great to uh to re-listen to this conversation as i was editing it and uh I don't know, Brian, I just got to say you're an inspiration and uh, I appreciate and I got a lot of value out of our talk. And I know you, dear listener, will as well. If you have anything you would like to comment on about this episode, you are always encouraged to go to mattselznick.com. The direct link for this episode is mattselznick.com slash sonatotem-098. Or you can just click on the podcast button right there on the homepage at mattselznick.com. It will take you to the main podcast page. Find episode 98. Get into that. And you'll find the comments form. Of course, you know how this works down at the bottom of the show notes. 
You should check out the show notes, by the way, because I'll have links to everything uh, linkable that we talked about in our conversation. If you would simply like to send me an email, you can do that at matt at mattselznick.com. And by the way, that's M-A-T-T-S-E-L-Z-N-I-C-K dot com. Send me an email at matt at mattselznick.com. I reply to everything. If you like, you can even just record a short little voicemail, maybe on your phone, and email that audio file to matt at mattselznick.com. I'll play it in a future episode of the show, and we'll have a sort of time-shifted conversation that way. I want to mention uh, two things. First of all, uh, toward the end of the conversation there with Brian, we got pretty deep into the weeds uh, about how to market to our reader community. This is exactly the kind of stuff that I help my clients with all the time. So if you are an author or a podcaster or really any kind of creator, check out mattselznick.com slash services and uh, maybe I can help you. I also must mention my member community. We call ourselves the Multiversalists and the patron members, the folks who have contributed anywhere from mm, five bucks and up per month to support this show and my other creative endeavors and the content that I bring to you and to receive a whole slew of special access and special content, including about, mm, gosh, about 400,000 words of fiction and nonfiction. The folks who become patron members of the multiversalist community, I would like to thank them right now. They include Zoe cohen Lay, J.C. Hutchins, Amelia Bowen, Jim Lewinson, and Ted Leonhardt. These are the folks who have Contributed every month, you can join them by going to mattselznick.com slash be a patron. If you get value out of this podcast, member patrons really help offset the cost of the show and the time and the energy and the effort that goes into creating it. This episode, uh, it's not quite done because I'm still recording it. Hi, I'm talking to you, so I must still be recording it, right? But this episode is probably going to clock me Mm, about 12 hours of work uh, when all is said and done. So if you appreciate it and you have the means, I would love it if you would become a member patron at mattselznick.com slash b-a-patron. The rest of it, hey, you know the drill, right? You listen to podcasts. You can also support the show by rating and reviewing anywhere you get your podcasts. Ratings and reviews help the show boost up in the search results on that particular podcasting platform, whether it's Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Google Play or whatever. However you get your podcasts, there is a way to rate and review. So I'd really appreciate that if you could do that. All right, my friends. I have other news, but I think I'll reserve that for a little interim episode the next episode of Sonatotum, between this and the next conversation episode. So for now, I hope you liked my conversation with Brian Chaffin. Remember, you can find him at geektells.com. You should absolutely read Accidental Intelligence. And for now, well, my name is Matthew Wayne Selznick. Take care.